Hello everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hope you are all doing great. I have a very helpful live today with an amazing guest with 30 years of experience in the financial industry. Hi Tarun, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Welcome to the live. So I was talking about my guest speaker today. Her name is Tessa Marie and she has about 30 years of experience in the financial industry. And I'm gonna actually talk about some important topics for actually securing your financial security in future. Hi Donato, welcome to the live. Yeah, I was talking about my guest speaker today and that I, we're gonna have great topics uh, about financial um, industry and how we can manage our financial uh, conditions in the best way. Hi Tessa, welcome. Okay, Tessa, let me bring you on. Hi, Tessa. Okay, now you're coming through. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? It's, it's connecting itself, so I have to wait. Oh, here we are. How are you? I'm amazing. How about you, Tessa? I am absolutely wonderful. I'm happy to see that we have matched our clothes. Oh, we did? <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Tessa. That's so, that is so nice. Yeah, thank you very much for coming to my live. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Anytime. Uh, everybody who is in our live today, uh, let me introduce my guest speaker today. We have a great lady with many, many, many years of experience in the financial industry. And I can't wait to hear from you, Tessa. Lots of experience, lots of knowledge. So, um, if you don't mind, I want to introduce you to my audience today. You want me to? Or you go right ahead. I will. I, 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 if you don't mind, I go over the introduction for you. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Tessa Mary is a successful and savvy businesswoman with 30 years of experience in the financial industry. She established and managed her own businesses for numerous years before transitioning to the financial industry. With her unique business experience and ability to communicate effectively, Tessa Marie has been a guest speaker for numerous groups and associations where she enlightens them on knowing the benefits of proper financial management. Wow. She was the manager of financial services at one of the leading financial institutions in Ontario. She has a designation as a personal financial planner, including personal financial counseling issued by the Institute of Canadian Bankers that has qualified her to provide her exceptional insights into personal financial and credit management. Tessa Mary is a successful author of two books, Controlling the Debt Monster and The Morning Blessings. Currently, Tessa Mary is engaged in IGTV videos daily where she shares her knowledge and life experiences helping others live their best life. Tessa Mary is also a public speaker life coach and financial health coach on the five pillars of prosperity. Wow, welcome to my life, Tessa. I am so happy to be here with you today. Thanks. Thank you, me too. Likewise, Tessa. <laughs> uh, so it's an honor to have somebody like you in my life, to hear from you, to learn from you. So if you let me, I'm going to start with my questions. Sure, go right ahead. Thank you. Tessa, number one, 
what effects does revolving credit have on your mortgage approval? And before you talk about the answer, I want you to uh, talk about what does it mean revolving credit? Because maybe some people do not know about that. Revolving credit, as you know, the word revolve means it goes around and around, right? Yes. But revolving credit is something that does not die. It has no end. And a credit card, a line of credit, whether it's secured by your home or unsecured, these are revolving credit. So those type of credit, they don't, you pay them and you bring the imbalance owing down and then you can use it again and you keep using it again. So it has a, it's eternal. It only dies when you die. If it doesn't kill you first. So, so what happens in the revolving thing and your, and your approval for any type of mortgage is that it makes, they count it as you owe that money, whether you owe it or not. So of course, it decreases your credit approval and the amount you can, be credit, um, you can get as a mortgage. And that's what it does. It decreases the amount of mortgage you can get. The more credit cards you have, the worse it is for you. Even if even if the balances of credit cards are zero, yes, it still affect. Yeah, you had that as your second question. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so if your balance is zero, it it does not matter. So what if you have five credit cards, five thousand on each? That's twenty five thousand dollars less of mortgage you will be approved of. If you have zero, it's still twenty five thousand dollars because your propensity to go and increase that credit is still there. Nobody's stopping you. After you get approved for the mortgage, you go and use the credit to furnish the house, buy a stove and fridge. And before you know it, $25,000 is gone. And once that money is gone, then it, it, it um, depletes your ability to pay off that debt, which is your mortgage debt. So your mortgage, so your institution who's going to give you that money for the mortgage has to protect themselves. In order to protect themselves, they do not give you the mortgage based on all these credit cards. So what I would tell my clients when I worked at the bank, knowing that they would not be approved if they kept all this credit card, not closing the credit card, but getting the credit card companies to decrease the limit, sometimes to $500. Because when you close them, it also affects your credit rating. So you decrease it and say, okay, so it's $500 limit on all of these cards. Okay, uh, Tessa, sorry to cut you off because you're, you're sharing a lot, of, a lot of like important information. So I want to just highlight on one of them that you said instead of, first of all, it's not good to have many credit cards. The less, the better. Correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Yes, the less, the better. My, I myself, I only have two credit cards. And the only reason I have two is because I have one with a $600 limit that I shop on Amazon and do online shopping with. The other credit card does have a larger limit, but I don't use it every day. So I keep it there. But my common card in my wallet all the time is at $600 limit. It's really not to your advantage. You have so many credit cards. They don't, exactly. they don't help you. They keep you, um, you know, like you're, you're going to be paying these things or you use them, you pick this one up. You've seen people doing that. They don't even know which card to use sometimes because there's so many. Uh, so thank you very much. And another point that you just mentioned for some people who already have some uh, credit cards, they didn't know. And now after watching this live, they want to actually do something about it. The best solution that you are suggesting is that instead of closing them, asking the bank to uh, bring down the limit. Am I right? That's perfectly right. And the reason why I said don't close it, because it's, it's a double-edged sword. If the, if the bank closes it on you, it's still bad. If you close it, it says you think you cannot afford to make the payments. Oh. So that another, so, so somebody else might say, oh, well, you close that card. Why? So if you're going for a mortgage and the mortgage officer says to you, you know, Nikki, you closed three credit cards. Why did you do that? And you might say, well, I just didn't want the exposure to that. And they could say, why? Is it because you couldn't pay it? So it's I see. a slight, a small negative message out to them. And of course, you don't want that. 
So yeah, one hundred percent. The best is to limit the credit amount. Okay, and uh, thank you, Tessa. And another question is that uh, when you bring the limit down, how long it takes uh, for it be to be reflected in the um, Equifax credit report, something like that? It will take. It will take maybe sometimes sixty days. Sixty days. Yeah. So you have a question. Um, later on that we can approach on it because okay. I'll be covered in that question. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tessa. Number two, I have lots of questions for you, Tessa. I hope you be patient with me. <laughs> I am all there. The point of it is serving, helping somebody understand it so they're not shocked or they don't make some choices that they shouldn't make. Thank so, you. Thank I'm you. Um, so I think we talked about the second question. If somebody has lots of credits, even with zero balances, how does that affect? So you said that it still affects on the credit report and of, of course the mortgage approval process, right? Mm -hmm. If a person has less than 20% down, we know that they will go under CMHC or Gen, Gen work. So could you please elaborate on that for people who might have lower than 20% uh, down payment? Yes. Thank you. Um, long ago, the government of Canada created Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And after that, they had another one. I forgot the name. It's a different E. And of course, then Genworth came in. But CMHC is still there. The purpose of that was the government wanted more people to be able to buy homes. And in order to do that, the government had to give them a kind of a surety to the bank that if you give this person who has 5% down on the value of their home and they can make the payments, we will insure that mortgage for you on their behalf. That if they forfeit on the mortgage, then we will be take, absorb that and we will take the fall for it. So that was the creation of CMHS, CMHNC. So what happens with the, with the corporation is that when you apply, you still have to qualify. And then the amount that you have to, there's the amount that you still bring up the mortgage again, the CMHC amount, that gets involved in the mortgage. It gets absorbed by the mortgage. So that is what happens. But one of the stipulations the bank has and a lot of people are not aware of that. If you don't have full 20% down to make that mortgage payment, um, that mortgage um, deposit you're on there, the, the bank is going to insist that they collect the property taxes of you. Because one of the first witnesses of most home buyers who don't have a lot of cash flow towards the expenses that they have created or to honor the... Um, expense that they said they would make arrangement to pay to honor the arrangements they have made in the bank or the institution. What happens is that the first thing they don't pay is the tax, the property tax bill. They just don't pay the property tax bill because they figure the government does not come knocking. But your property tax bill, the bank is responsible for that. So what the bank does in the first 12 months, now this is something people must understand, they collect 18 months of taxes. So although you pay your tax annually six times a year, they will say, let's say your tax bill is $4,000, your property tax. They will add two more thousand dollars to it, so that makes it $6,000. So they divide that by 18 months, and they will take that payment from you and until it comes to that they have six month of payment sitting in an account on your name at the bank, not an account for you, but a tax account, a property tax account. The bank pays the property taxes to the municipalities in June and January. So there has to always be six months sitting there. So when they get that tax bill, you will get a tax bill and they will get a tax bill. Everything is coordinated really smoothly. So your tax bill, you will and they say, do not pay, because they don't expect you to pay. The bank is, is owing them the money. So the bank will pay them. So the, that's why in 18 months, your tax amount payable to the bank is going to be one and a half times more than you would normally do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happens now 
you take that after the first 12, the first 18 months, 12 months, they stop, they lower the amount and bring it down like 4,000 divided by 12. But because they already have six months sitting there, so they can do that. And that's why they do that. I see. Thank you very much, um, Tessa. Uh, now, getting back to credit card topic again, what happens if somebody has a bad credit or have a bankruptcy in his credit history? Okay, your credit history is like your driver's license. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that. You have to treat your credit um, history just like you, you treat the, your, your driver's um, license. You're, if you break the rule, you're going to be punished. So mm -hmm. if you have a bankruptcy or you have lots of late payments, um, and I, I, I'm going to address late payments first before I go into bankruptcy. So if you are in the habit of having late payments, it is reflected on your credit history. It reflects on your credit score. So you have to know for sure that you pay those credit um, cards or whatever credit. It could be, it doesn't only have to be the bank credit card because now your Rogers phone, all these things, your Bell phone, and your, everything is paid through credit. If you don't pay those credit cards when they are supposed to be paid, what happens is that it, it gets into a way that after 30 days, it is reported as So I, for, the reason why I'm addressing this is because I have met people who have said, I, I paid it in 31 days, so I should only be one day late. No, you do, you're 31 days late. So although you have a 30 day grace period, you must pay it within those 30 days. Otherwise it's late. And if it's due on today's the 17th of March, and if on your um, report or your bill, it says March 17th, that doesn't mean that's the day you pay it. That is, means that it is the, the day they want it in their bank account. So you should pay it a few days before. 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 So if it, if the seventeenth falls on a Saturday or on a Sunday, you better pay it on a Thursday. The latest you can pay it is a Thursday. If you pay it after six on Friday night, it reflects on Monday's date, which is the nineteenth. So now you're thirty two days or thirty three days late. And that brings down your credit score, your credit rating. It shows your potential creditor that you're not trustworthy, you're not honoring the arrangements you have made with them. And that's what the mortgage officer says. And he said, if you didn't honor to pay a simple credit card, how can I trust you to pay a $500,000 mortgage? Exactly. So, so I, always put, I always place that type of decision under the choices and decisions you make today determines the life you live tomorrow. So that's the biggest one. Now, bankruptcy, when somebody, somebody files for bankruptcy or credit proposal, it has a huge effect. The credit proposal says four years on your record. The bankruptcy says seven years. Seven and years. A, yes, and a lot of people have this, oh, it's only seven years, but it's archived. A lot of them will tell me at the bank, they'll say to me, well, Tessa Mary, it's seven years ago, and it's no longer on my credit rating. It, it, it has dropped off. And they use that word commonly. It has dropped off. And I go, well, do you know how it went? Oh, where, it, where, it, where it was dropped off to. Where it drops off is in a file called archives. When something is in archives, it can still be found. That doesn't mean it, it has disappeared into the ethers. So if it says it's dropped off, when I press that button, it can come up that you had all this credit and you had a bankruptcy at that day for this company and all the companies and all of that. So it never really leaves you it's a stain on your reputation. It stays there. And that even if you think you cannot see it, and yes, you can get credit after that if you behave yourself and build your credit and pay the bills as they requested. But bankruptcy will prevent you from getting a mortgage unless you have reestablished yourself. And reestablishing yourself is not getting a prepaid credit card. A prepaid credit card does not if your credit history is not re-establishing your credit at all. So people have that. That's a very, 
A part of credit and loans and mortgages, people must understand. Because sometimes they take the advice from a person who knew somebody or some story. Oh, and they got their credit back. You don't get it back. What you have lost, you have lost. You have to now rebuild your credit. So if you have a bankruptcy and it's over, in your, and you're going through the first seven years, what you need to do is open an RSP, open a savings account, open a tax free savings account. That will show the bank, true, my history is bad, but I am trying now. I am, and they will see this, oh, you have an RSP. So that means you're working towards establishing a future retirement plan for yourself. So they see that your attitude's changing. Mm -hmm. I had a doctor who had a $500 credit card given to him when he was at university. He ignored the payment of that card. Later on, he, was, he said to me, that I'm repeating what happened. He said to me, I did my, told my uncle I have, I have this credit card. And the uncle said to me, ah, don't worry about $500 credit card. The bank will, will write it off. So he said, he went and he was a doctor and he came to get a million dollar mortgage. And guess what? That showed up. And at that time, he owed over $8,000 on interest. It never died. It wasn't with my bank, but he had to go and find $8,000. And it was a funny thing because when I found it, I said, you have to go there and find out how much it is. So he said to me in his ego, Oh, it's only eight thousand dollars. I can pay for that. I said, "You better go to the bank and find out exactly what the amount is, because this report was done, and there is more interest on it." He still was so arrogant. He did not listen to me. He went. He brought them the check. They said, "Okay." I went and I submitted it. They said, "No, no, no. He owes that bank another twenty-five hundred dollars." So all of that held back his mortgage. The vendor. I went to the lawyer and asked for $5,000 um, a month because they had to delay the closing of the property. Wow. So, so bad credit can, can come back like a, like a 0.33, you know, if you're doing math, or like a bad penny. And that's what people don't understand. Do not joke with it. It will cripple you. And another thing that is now going on the credit history is child support payment. If you don't do that, it will get reported to that. So we have to watch these bankruptcies and these type of things. But you will have a hard time. It will be harder for you to get credit if you have had late, late payments and harder, and in some cases, no. You won't get it with an A lender. Maybe a B lender might have a, 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 a more lax attitude and give it to you, but an A lender would. And if you go to a B lender, then your interest rate is higher. So not honoring the arrangements you made in your life at 19 can cost you when you're 40. Wow. Yes. So that's very, very sensitive. This, this history of credit card, everything about it, it's very, very sensitive. Extremely. It's like a driver's license. You bring the rule you're going to pay. You have to, you have to, you have to take care of it like you take care of your license. 100%. Thank you, Tessa. Now, could you please tell me uh, what happens if a spouse of a person has a bad credit or bankruptcy? The same, right? Well, not, it, it, it reflects on you. Because when you have committed to that relationship, you also committed to their history. So it reflects on you. So if my, I have a good credit and my spouse or my intended spouse has bad credit, is going to affect me because we come together as a pair and and i cannot fix your credit for you but you can destroy mine mm. because sometimes i might if i don't know and you know they say you get a, a prenup they should have a prenup for credit history <laughs> because if we're getting together and i don't know how bad your credit is and I apply for a card on your name. They don't care. They'll give me a card on, your, on my name for you. It's my card. I am the primary card holder. And you're the secondary card holder. So that, guess what? If you don't make those payments, it, 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 it goes on my credit rating. So that's one way it breaks down. And we need to know that. So yes, 
a spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend that you tie your financial life with will have an effect on you. If you have a joint account with them and they wrote a check on that joint account and they did not put the money in there, they don't care. As long as their name is on that account. So let's put it this way. We have a joint savings account we're saving to buy a home. And you have your checking account at the same bank or branch or bank. And you have a check that comes. The bank doesn't care. Your name is on that joint account. They don't care who else is on there. They will just take the money from there and put it and pay and pay the bounce check. So it affects me another way because that is money we're saving to buy a home or a car or one of vacation. So, so Tessa, go ahead. Yeah. So those type of habits have to be known before you get into a financial relationship with someone. You should. A lot of people don't, and of course they they live to regret it at a later date. So I have a question because I'm dealing with buyers, for example, and they, for example, husband and wife or partners, they want to go on title for yeah. a real estate purchase together. So uh, you're saying that if one of them has a bad credit history, then it's better for, for them that the other one only goes on title so that he or she can be easier, be approved for the mortgage and these kind of things. Am I right? Well, the thing about that is, I cannot tell you you're right, because that honestly should not be the way to run it, honestly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I could tell you that's the best way to do it. I'm going to tell you people do that. Um, what it is, is that putting the person on the title, they still own the house, right? Yeah. Title. So if something happens and have a bank or they on their own do something else, will they come after that house? So you see, that's why I will not say that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So you can have make an arrangement with them, a legal arrangement, that they will make so much payment and even like that they might not honor that. They they showed you already who they who they were they already. They're not they don't value debt. They, they don't value the ability to have credit. So they should really make an effort to fix the credit. And then as you were saying, they go on title. But can you qualify or for the mortgage by yourself? Then that is yeah, just... Yeah, that's, that's another that question. Is own and, and have them live there as a tenant. A tenant that, that pays. So they, they agree you have... A, you can even sign a real lease with them. And sometimes we will look at that lease and say, okay, so you have a lease with this person and they're going to rent the part of the house. Yes, they are. So that lease agreement with the amount of the payment they're making can be used as income so that they say, no, you have this additional income with your smaller income, you're better able to pay for this mortgage. It's all about protecting their money and the money of their investors, which is 100%. all of us who owns, who has an account at that institution. 100%. Thank you, Tessa. So if you allow me, I want to introduce you again uh, to the people who joined our live right now. First of all, thank you very much, Tessa, for your precious time to <laughs> accept my invitation. And thank you, everyone, who are in our live today, I have a special, special guest with lots of knowledge, years of knowledge. And her, she's Tessa Marie is a successful and savvy businesswoman with 30 years of experience in the financial industry. She established and managed her own businesses for numerous years before transitioning to the financial industry. With her unique business experience and ability to communicate effectively, Tessa Marie has been a guest speaker for numerous groups and associations where she enlightens them on knowing the benefits of proper financial management. She was the manager of financial services at one of the leading financial institutions in Ontario. She has a designation as a personal financial planner, including personal financial counseling issued by the Institute of Canadian Bankers that has qualified her to provide 
her exceptional insight into personal, financial, and credit management. Tessa Mary is a successful author of two books, Controlling the Deaf Monster and The Morning Blessings. Currently, Tessa Mary is engaged in IGTV videos daily where she shares her knowledge and life experiences helping others live their best life. Tessa Mary is also a public speaker, life coach, and financial health coach on the five pillars of prosperity. Thank you, Tessa. You're welcome, Nikki. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next question. What is the effect of the term of the mortgage on monthly mortgage payments, Tessa? For example, we have a term which is five years rather than a term which is only three years. How does it affect the monthly mortgage payment for people? Okay, I, I'm going to, I want to make sure you get it. So I have an example. So I might, you might see my head look, looking down and that's why. So just take it for a bit. I want to make sure that they understand it because this is very important. So what is the effect of a, of a three-year term on a mortgage in, on a five-year term on a mortgage payment? That is your answer. That's your question. Yes. What is the effect of the term of the mortgage on monthly mortgage payments? So if we have a three-year term rather than a five-year term, how does it affect it? So for example, if you take a hundred thousand dollar three year mortgage mortgage rate at one point seven five, for example, your payment would be about four hundred and ten dollars over twenty five year amortization. So it's it's there. It's three years four hundred and ten. The same mortgage would at at the interest rate four or five or six year term is two point one, and that would cost you four hundred and twenty five and a five-year term over 25 years. So you see the three-year term is, is a little bit high. And when you go to five or six, it's only about $15 more. Yet the three-year the three -year rate is, is lower, 1.75. Mm -hmm. So it affects the amortization and, because, and it affects the amount of payment that you make. Because the third, the, if the three-year term will have a higher payment than the five-year term because you have five years to spread it through. And the three-year is a shorter term. The amortization is the same amortization period. Another thing it affects is that every three years you need to renew in opposite to every five years. And that's really the big difference. Not too much more than that. All right. Thank you, Tessa. Um, we had a great topic about RSD in our previous live together, and I found that it's very, very useful for a lot of people. So uh, I appreciate if you talk a little bit about RSD and what are the benefits of it for uh, first-time homebuyers. Okay. I will talk about RSD as a, as a house with three, with, three, with three rooms in it. So RSD... The name Registered Retirement Saving Plan is a house. Inside of the house, you have three benefits of having an RSP. So the first benefit is, let's say your income, annual gross income is 40000 And you've now decided you'll do a $5,000 RSP. So your, but your boss, your company where you work, your manager takes your taxes, your income tax for the income tax department, are based on an income of 40000 and they do that for the entire year. But at the end of the year, when you go to get your taxes done, you have a $5,000 um, registered retirement savings plan that you created. So your tax consultant, your income tax consultant, will take $5,000 off your $40,000 income. So now your gross income has dropped to 35000 but your boss or your company has taken taxes below 40. So that triggers a refund for that 5,000, the amount of tax that was collected by your company, sent to the government of Canada on your behalf, 
on 40,000, no, it's not that at all because your true income is 35. No, that $5,000 RSP is tax sheltered money. That's why they gave you back the refund from that. So that is win win number one. So that refund, I always told my clients, use it to pay for your RSP for next year. Or, that, you know, never use it to pay for that. And that's another story. So the second time, time that you, of course, this is what you're talking about, is right in the middle. So you're a young person and a young couple and you've been doing your RSP for years and you decide you're going to buy a house and you both have 35000 in each of your RSPs. So you can both take it and put it on, the, on your house as a down payment or you can use it to buy pizza when you're moving or buy furniture, buy shoes and stove. They don't care what you use that $35,000 for. It, as long as it is done within the time you're purchasing that new home as a new first time home buyer. So you have that $35,000 and you, let's say you have another 70,000 between you. So now your down payment can easily be $1,140,000. So you're giving yourself selves a $70,000 um, mortgage free of interest. So you have given yourself a mortgage and you're not paying interest on it. So that's what it does. And then after the second year you're in the house, you would have to pay $2,350 back to the RSP, not to the government. People think you're giving the money to the government. No, you're putting the money back into your RSP. So that is, so you would contribute to your RSP as you already did. But after the, so the third year in that house, two years later, the third year, you will have to make contributions that are equal to that amount. So, for example, if you took it and you divide it by 26 periods, it's, it's not a lot of money. You put every month back in there. And that way, you're putting it. So when you get to be 65 or 71, there is money for you to have an extra pension. You have reestablished what it meant for, for your retirement. Now, if you ignore that, and you don't pay that money back, every year they're going to increase your income by that amount until you have paid it back because you did not pay it back to yourself. You gave yourself a loan and you didn't pay it back. And that's what that's the message you sent to, your, to the government. So they're going to say, we have to get that money back from you because the arrangement was, we need you to have some money for your retirement and you agree. So now we, we won't take it from you, but we're going to increase your income from 40000 to 42350 for every year you don't put it back. And that's what it does for you. Thank you, Tessa. Um, so the next question is that what is the benefit of RSP uh, for, in, for investors? They're not first-time home buyers. Well, it really doesn't have... A benefit where they can use the cash but it establishes them that there you are you you have uh, leverage in your home your exact family home to buy this property but we can see you're really good because you have this nice big fat RSP there you not we cannot touch it you cannot touch it but we know you have an RSP account so it gives you kind of credibility or it gives you that oomph so they show that you are an investor. So you invest in yourself. No, you're investing in property for more growth. So it, it's a good, it, it's like part of, a good part of your resume, of your financial health. It shows that you know how to manage money and, what, and how to make plans for the future. And that's what that does for you. I, you can, it doesn't do anything else. It just shows that you're an established human being with common sense and taking care of your future. And you're making some really good choices and decisions. You can leverage your home, of course, and that's okay. Excellent. Thank you, Tessa. Um, what is the benefit of TFSA for a person who wants to buy real estate? <laughs> Lots of benefits, huge benefits, amazing benefits. That's cash. Oh, I'm curious. <laughs> It is. It is. It's great benefit. Um, the amount you put, you have a certain amount the government allowed. It used to be fifty five hundred. I'm not sure. I'm sure it's gone up. Um, and 
that money is is collecting interest, right? or, or you can invest it in stocks and or bonds or income funds or index funds, and and all the profit you make is tax free. It is not a deductible thing like RSP. You cannot take it off your um, your annual income like you do with an RSP. It's not registered. It needs to have a beneficiary, but it's not registered. You know, so that tax savings account, you can use that money to do anything you want. It, you have no, there's no penalty for removing it. There is penalty though, if you have already contributed all what you should contribute because if there's a standard amount and you withdraw it and you didn't use it for that purpose and you go to put it back, it will say that you're investing more and they can tax you on it. So it's good if you take the money from your RSP and it will not increase, go up or over the limit to set it somewhere else before you move it back into the savings account. Excellent. Um, Tessa, the next question is about mortgage. Uh, if somebody is going to have a closing, how long before the closing date should he, uh, he or she start his mortgage process? How long does it take? The mortgage process is not the problem. The mortgage process, as you maybe well know, can be done over a weekend. It can be done over the internet in days, in minutes, if all your ducks are in the row. Remember when we were talking about, I think it was question number two or three, on the credit, to all the credit cards with the zero balances? Yes. Okay. So this part of the discussion should be done if you if you don't know and you're a first time home buyer i recommend you go to at least four to six months early to set it up properly and i and you have to hope and pray you get a financial advisor at your financial institution that is wise and knows those things and and care about you more than they care about what they're selling for you mm -hmm. to you so if you go in and you don't have the experience, that person needs to kind of be your babysitter. So what they would observe is that, oh, you know, Nikki, you have seven credit cards. Mm. If you apply for this mortgage, with those seven credit cards, with those huge limits on it, you might not qualify. So I recommend, and that's what they should say, I recommend that you decrease the limit. No, if you only have a weekend, you're not going to de decrease the limit in a weekend or a couple of months because you want it to be reported to the credit bureau. So that's why you need months. So that your bank say, okay, her limit is 500 instead of 5,000. 5, so you see what I mean? Yeah. So if you're going to apply for a mortgage to get all your ducks in a row and for the, act the actual mortgage qualification period and buying that home is seamless and stressless with no anxiety, give yourself four to six months to prepare. Go and talk about it. Find out about it. Four to six months. Do all your homework. Ask questions. Call an advisor. If the person is not willing to talk to you or they're too busy to help you, then, you know, you're going to the wrong bank because you're giving them business. So if that person does, is in a rush, and it's just come, sam, sam, sign here, go and no explanation. No, you don't do that. The minute that person is not talking in the language that you can understand and comprehend and can see, speak it again, then you don't want that person to be your advisor. You might as well pick up your papers and go somewhere else. You have a right to shop around to get somebody that cares about you as an individual and not as you as a number. And you have demand that of your financial institution. You people forget that you are the one that keeps the doors open. So they, if you notice the financial advisor at your institution is just ready to sell you something and you're not sure and you're confused and your mental capacity is not grasping it, then that is not the place you should be. You need to talk to them and say, listen, I need you to explain this to me so I understand this. Because you see, buying a home is the largest and biggest um, invest um, purchase you'll ever make in your life, in most of our cases, especially today. So you better be well organized and prepared to understand that. So the mortgage process should take four to six months. 
if you're rushing to it, chances are you're making an emotional decision based on fear. When the agent says there's 10 people bidding on that, and you're not yet prepared at the bank, but you think there's a scarcity of housing, so you're going to sign emotionally, and that can be detriment to you and your family. So start the process early. You don't buy a house because your cousin has just bought one. You don't buy a house because your friend has bought one and told you there's one across the street for sale that you want to have. You have to buy it when you're prepared and you're mentally ready, emotionally. It is a big emotional decision. Having said, don't make an emotional decision. It is still an emotional decision to buy your first home because it's a big investment and the biggest in your life for most of us. So when you are looking at it, you need, I say it's four to six months. I wouldn't go less than that. And make do your homework, ask questions, a lot of questions. And, and don't just sign. Let them explain why they want you to sign there. Great points. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, we are almost getting to the like last questions. In the meantime, I would uh, ask the people uh, if anybody in the live have any questions for Tessa. Uh, please uh, write them down here. And also, I have a question from Donato. Uh, it's related to our one of the uh, topics in the beginning that you were talking about you t your two credit cards, that one of them has only $600 limit. So he's asking uh, why the limit is only 600 So is there any reason for that? You want to talk about it, Tessa? Of course, certainly. The purpose for having a low-limit credit card when you're shopping on the internet or you're shopping in stores, especially stores that are not your normal shopping places for small things. These are the cards, this constant shopping on the internet or shopping anywhere. These are the, the amount, if it is compromised, it's only $600. So it's not a big deal. Although if it is compromised, your financial institution will re reimburse you the money, but you have to wait sometimes months or six to 10 weeks while they investigate. So therefore, it inhibits you from using the card. No, you can't. You have to get a new card. So the best thing to do is to have a small card for everyday purposes. And for the, you know, the purchase that you would make, you have a flat tire, you need this, you need that, you're shopping on the internet. And that's why I did it, because of the, these cards can be compromised, and people's cards are compromised all the time. All right. Thank you very much. Tessa, uh, for the last questions, uh, what are your advice for current property owners? Current property owners, my advice for them is that keep your property in good shape. Um, the cost of borrowing these days is very low. So this is the chance if you can afford to make the payments to get a secured line of credit. You can use it for investment to buy. Now that the price of condos are, are, low, are cheaper, but it's not going to stay that way. So, for example, that person can buy a new build using the equity from your present home um, and put as a down payment. It takes four years for a condo to be built. So that gives them time to increase. It, it, it increases in value, although they say, no, the condo market is depressed. But as you know, Nikki, that will not last long in Canada. Um, the reason why is that we have an active immigration line. If in Canada, because we let people in, we need people to come from the border with a smaller income and push, the, push it up. So when there is demand on the market, on the housing market, of course, the, the price goes up. So of the, the, the price of, of condos in Canada, especially in Ontario, does not drop. People have this thing of thinking there's going to be a bubble and it's bursting. If I had waited for the bubble to burst, I would still be waiting. And I've been in, in the housing market and buying and selling properties since I was 23 with my brothers. So I, I know in the 80s, everybody said, oh, it's going to go and you people lose their house. Of course, there are always some people going to fall in the crack and lose their home because perhaps they were overextended. And the, when the rates went up to 18%. But then the immigration doors opened again. And once that opened, it closed the economy because new people have new demands, new things are happening. And Canada has a, 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 a scoring way of entering people into the country. So people have either have skills or they're coming in with some money. 
and therefore they're able to keep the economy going. And when your economy is going, everybody um, gets better. In the 80s, which is funny, when that happened, a lot of small companies, even Bad Boy, went under. From the Danforth, from Victoria Park, all the way to Woodbine and Coxwell, was all small companies, furniture companies, and stores, and, you know, and they went under. Because they had, for a time, they had stopped the immigration doors, they had shut the door for a while. So these companies are the entrance level for the new immigrants to shop for home appliances and home furniture. And Bad Boy was one of those that, that went down at that time. And after when things pick up, they maybe had a big financial base. They were able to regenerate and go back. So although the market is low, if you have a home and you want to look at something investing for the future, now is the time. The, the price of borrowing is really low. So a, a home secured line of credit and you put it towards a new bill and you actually rent it out. I have done that. I did that in two, two Dong at um, Concord at my dome, and that was all those years ago. And we did that with uh, different members of the family did that. And my daughter still lives there. So it was, it took two or two and two or six, we took off the occupancy. And most, all of them were over $150,000 more than when we paid for them. So right away, we had a string of income that we could use because now the values had gone up. We could actually mortgage it for more and use that extra money and buy another property. So if you are wise and you do it property, properly and you don't overextend yourself and you keep your eye on the ball and you, you make proper choices, you can win in that. So a home buyer sitting on equity and wondering and being afraid, this is the time. Because the price of a, a line of credit is really low. And for the first, you can pay the interest only until the rental property starts to pay for the rent and, and you can pay it and make the payments from there. But even if you don't, cannot do it right away, you are still building equity. It's still an investment. Because last night on my live, I talk about the consistency pays dividend. So dividend is what you get when you invest in a stock. When you invest in real estate, you still get dividend because the price will go up, the value, sorry, will go up in four years. You might rent it out. It will pay for itself. But four years later, it's not going to pay back what you borrowed to pay for it. So that's dividend. So anything you do consistently will give you dividend. But you must be wise and take advantage of the market. And now is the time to take advantage of the market. Thank you, Tessa. Now, uh, one of my uh, dear guests and uh, my client, Haroon, is asking, can Tessa help us one-on-one? -on -one? I do that for a price. <laughs> 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 yes, I do. They can DM me and I'll tell them and I'll guide them. I Thank might, you. depends on where you are financially. If you need a financial guidance, I'll give it to you for free. But you have to DM me, and that's what I'll do. Yes, I'll help you one on one, but you can DM, DM me, and you don't have to pay me until you start making money. I will increase your financial health, and when you start making financial wealth, I'll send you a bill. I'm just joking. Yes. Thank you, Tessa. He's a great client of mine, and I appreciate if you take care of him. I will. Thank you. Last question. Uh, what are your advice uh, for first-time home buyers? Okay, can I go back to number 11? Sure, I, go ahead. I wanted to tell you, we started that and I went into the equity thing because I'm so um, hype about that. You know, of course, this is the nice, if you're already a homeowner with lots of equity, this is the time to make renovations in your home. The contractors have been stuck at home, number one. So they haven't been making as much, they don't have as much business. Now they're coming back. They're going to be hungry for more business. So you have in a position to better able to negotiate better prices. You don't have to go to the most expensive one or the cheapest one because either one is not to your benefit. So you work somewhere in the middle. And this is the time to use some of the equity to put in a new bathroom, a new kitchen. These are the things that sell home. A, a, a swimming pool is for your pleasure. The next buyer might just fill it with dirt. But the kitchen, everybody has to use the kitchen and they must use the bathroom. So 
Uh, keeping your home where you are in right now is also dividend money in your pocket. If not in your pocket, in the pocket of your children because they'll inherit from you. And that's where legacy begins. Okay? I forgot to mention. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, do you want to talk about uh, first-time home buyers? First-time home buyers, we gave them a lot of information, but I will go over it again. First-time home buyers is if you know you want to be a first-time home buyer or you're planning that, and I said, give yourself six months, clean up your credit. Clean it up. Pay your bills on time. Even your cell phone bills on time. If you have child support payments, make them on time. If you, if you have tickets for the government or traffic tickets, pay them on time. You don't know where the hands of the, of the things are going because everything is interconnected as much as you think they're not. And none of the banks, they're competitive, but they all will support each other, right? So although they're competitors, fine for you and your business, but if you're going against them, they will stand up for each other. Just so, one question. Uh, sorry to cut you off. So when you uh, say pay, pay off your credit card, uh, does it mean, does it include minimum payment as well or do oh, you no. pay it completely? Minimum payment is the absolute, credit cards, Nikki, needs a whole new show. <laughs> minimum payment is keeping yourself in debt for as long as you live. Oh. The worst thing you can do for credit card is to pay minimum pay payment. The banks love you. The credit institutions all love you because you are like a cash cow. They can count on you giving them money for the rest of your life because you, wow. only, you owe $2,500 and you're paying a minimum payment of $15. It will take you 18 years to pay. You heard one eight, 18 years to pay it off. It's right there in small print on your credit card statement. So if you look, you'll find it. Minimum payment is not a good thing to do. Then you are overextending yourself. And if you do that now, you cannot pay a minimum payment on a mortgage. There is no such thing. Yes. And there is penalties if you don't pay it. Yes. And it ruins your credit. So you need to clean up your credit, build your savings, your RSP, build your tax savings account, have it done automatically. Don't trust yourself to pay yourself. Your the government doesn't to pay them the income tax that you owe on your income. That's why they go to your, your, your company. And if they don't pay, they can go to jail. So nobody trusts you to pay, to pay them. Why are you going to trust yourself to pay you? Your bank will do it for you with an automatic payment thing every month or every week, every day, whatever you want them to do. So set up yourself for success by setting up good financial habits. I can help them with financial help. My, 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 my core, or my, my passion is to increase people's financial health so that they can buy a house because that is the best thing you can do for yourself is buy yourself a condo, start there. That is your springboard towards bigger wealth. It's that condo. And if people are afraid and people are telling them, don't pay, you have to pay maintenance fee, I say that is utter, utter rubbish. And it's actual everywhere you go you have maintenance right i exactly i had to send a check not a check i had to pay online for the man to come cut my grass i pay to my snow i have to pay somebody to come clean my windows when my roof goes i'm responsible for it if i have to do the furnace whereas all of these things are done for you and you have a concierge somebody to open the door for you when you come there are flowers there you don't have to plant them there's, there's um, salt, so you don't trip. So maintenance in a home is more than maintenance on a condo, no matter what people say. In some cases, no, you pay hydro and you pay for electricity, but you mightn't pay for heat. You mightn't pay for water. I pay for all of those things in a home. So the person who is stupid enough to give you that advice, and you being stupid, more stupid than them to take that advice and don't buy your condo, ask them where they live. Because in some cases, they have never bought a chicken coop themselves. So they're renting, but they figure they have the right to tell you what you should do or should not do. If all you can afford right now is a condo, and if you're single and you're young and you're working downtown or you're working in an area, get yourself a condo. At least you're in the market. 
when things change and that increases, use the condo to give you the five hundred thousand dollars you need to go buy the million dollar house. If you did, if you rented for five years, at the end of five years, when you're walking away, you're taking your clothes. Hey, just your clothes and the furniture. But if you bought and you're there for five years, when you're leaving, you're leaving with money in your pocket. At least your down payment comes back to you. That's what is very least. And in Ontario, it's always more than that. It's so, always more than that, one hundred percent. But the thing about that, get yourself ready to be financially wealthy. If you're a first-time home buyer, you have rules to keep. You have um, arrangements you make. You have to honor them. So get into the habit by honoring the small thing, paying your credit cards on time. On time means three days before the due date. Um, if you have a, a parking ticket, pay. If you have a, something on your a speeding ticket, pay. If you owe somebody money and it's registered like uh, support, make sure the payments are going in because that will affect it. Everything is connected these days by the computer. And people think they can take advantage of the government. That didn't happen. So if you're an entrepreneur and you have your own business and you plan to buy your own home for the first time, pay the government some taxes. Sooner or later, they're going to find out you cannot survive. And they know nobody can survive on $5,000 a year of net tax, net income and home or own. And have a home and have children and a wife to support. They know that. So the day they set their eye on you, they will charge you back taxes for the last seven years. And they have ways and methods of finding it out because whoever paid you an income has to report that they paid so-and-so an income. So for, for um, first-time home buyers, they really need a, a lesson. They, they stuff they must do. But don't be afraid of buying a condo. Buy them now because in 10 years, you won't be able to afford them. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you, Tessa. Thank you very much. And Jennifer, my uh, great client, she's commenting here. She's saying great point. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for coming to the live. She's saying it was a big jump, but I'm glad I bought my first condo. Congratulations again to you, Jennifer. All yes. the misconceptions you mentioned are all things I heard or believe. Doing this research and speaking to professionals is so key. It is. 100%. It is. If you do your research and ask questions, keep asking. And if the person doesn't have the patience to help you, then you're in the wrong place. Go somewhere else. It's not a communist country. hundred <laughs> percent. And Tessa, to be honest with you, like uh, in the banks, nobody told me that minimum payment is not good for me. No. They don't say that. Of course not, because they're no. making... Mickey, you understand how it works, right? Yes. If, if you purchase $2,000 worth of, of whatever, and, and all you're paying is $15, they don't care. Your interest rate is 29% or 9%. Exactly. So you, every time is compound interest. So you're paying interest on last month interest and last month interest, and you keep paying interest on interest. They're making money hands over fist, and that is exactly what it is. Your hand over fist, hand over fist. Exactly. <laughs> it's compound interest, and therefore, they love it. All you have to do is pay the $15, but it's good for the bank, not good for you. And these are the things people have to, have to ask. Who is it good for? If the bank is benefiting, fine. I am not against the bank making money. I, I don't do that. I never will, will say the bank or say bad things about the bank and all of that. I don't believe in that because it's a business. And a business is where people make money. They have investors who invested the money. And if you were one of them, you would want them to make money. So one of the things I stress, even in my morning lessons, and I stress this when I do my IG Live, mind your own business. Your business is your life. Your life is your business. Run your life like a big corporation runs its business. They know where everything is all the time. Not only your money, but everything to do with you. Where is your passport? Don't lose your passport. It's going to cost you money. Where is this? Where is that? So a big corporation is there to make money. And they have rules. And you don't like them. You can always go somewhere else. But... Don't look at them as a bad place. And if the person is smiling and you can see all the 122 teeth in their mouth, that doesn't mean they're your friend. 
They are there to earn a living. They're going to do what is best for the bank and for themselves unless you tell them what you want. And therefore, that is where it's important for you to educate yourself. Go to the place prepared. Go when prepared. Be like a girl guide. Be prepared. Go with a notebook. Ask questions. Even if you look confused, get on the internet. Google stuff. Google is not always right, but it will give you an idea. Then from that, go with a question to your banker. And if they don't have the time and they're looking at you, what, you get up. If they don't have the time to look after you, say, it's okay, I'll go somewhere else. And you just leave. And you, because you have to be, you have to show, you have, you know. Don't sit there and just shake your head and say, oh yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and, and they tell me, but my banker really likes me. I say, no, he just likes what you can do for his pocket. And that's what matters. Sorry, Nikki. 100%. Thank you very much, Tessa. Thank you very much for your time, for these like amazing information that you shared with us, with my audience. Uh, again, I appreciate everyone who uh, made the time to come to this live today. And I'm sure that they're going to watch it again because we talked about a lot of, lot of things. Yes, and Again, thank you very much, uh, Tessa. It was a pleasure having me um, having me come to your show. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for having me. Because my one, one of my, my motto is to educate, enlighten, and encourage everybody I meet for, to better financial health. So if we touch one person today, it was worth it. Because that one person can create a string. So everybody who was here, please share and like this this live and i hope you got something from it and if you did share it if you like it share it let somebody else see what nikki does and what she brings and what kind of person she is she's a real estate agent that cares if she didn't care she wouldn't have had me come to tell you the ups and downs of financial health so make sure you remember that and share it to all those you can and if you know someone looking for a real estate agent that's the place to go it's good to see nikki because thank you if she's not sure, she's going to phone me or phone somebody and get the answer for you. You are in good hands with Nikki. So have a wonderful afternoon, Nikki, and so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Tessa. I'm humbled by your words. And thank you very much, uh, very much everybody. And have a great rest of the day. Thank okay. you. Back again sometime. Thank you. Bye-bye.